to explain to you uh, how we would go about explaining the gospel. And uh, what I'm going to talk about comes straight out of the book. Um, I hope it's not news to any of you, um, but it's just the way in which we uh, describe the gospel and where we, you know, we go through this with people uh, when they were responding or you know, in the book. Um, but to start, you know, I wanted to share another John Piper quote, I've mentioned it a few times today. Uh, the goal of evangelism is to make a mystery clear. Uh, the gospel is not a mystery because it's confusing or obscure, like a tricky riddle, but it's a mystery because no one would ever know it or think of it unless God had made it plain. And I think it's very important that we make it plain to people and make it simple. So how do we teach people to share the gospel? I, I think I've said this before today, assume nothing. Um, explain simply. Uh, conversations, not monologue, and we spoke about the whole God test approach, which is just an example of that. Uh, what is the gospel? Well, this is a quote that comes from the guy that wrote the, uh, the God test, actually. Um, and it's not in Hope Reborn, this bit. It's the only bit of this talk that isn't. Um, but it's very consistent with what we explain in Hope Reborn. So the way he describes the gospel is this. The gospel is the good news that God became man in Jesus Christ, that he lived the life that we should have lived, that he died the death that we should have died in our place. And three days later, he was raised from the dead, proving that he is the Son of God and offering the gift of salvation to all who repent and believe the gospel. So it comes from Rice Brooks. And I think it's a helpful summary of the gospel, but I think it's very important that we don't just take a summary of the gospel like that, but that we also understand where it's come from in the Bible and make sure that our people know where it's come from in the Bible and that our people can point their friends to the Bible verses and explain it to them. So I talk about the story of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, 3, it says this, I deliver to you as first importance, but I also received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Now, one of the reasons I put this verse up is that, unfortunately, I have heard many presentations of the gospel that stop here. Okay? And it goes something like this, well, you know, we all sinned, and... We are separated from God and we deserve God's judgment. But Jesus came and he died for us and he took our punishment that you could be forgiven. Now would you like to respond and become a Christian so that you too can be forgiven? <laughs> now with all due respect, if you stop there, and I used to be guilty of this myself, you've not preached the gospel. Okay? Because the gospel has to include the resurrection of Jesus. You can't just assume the resurrection of Jesus. You can't just assume that the person knows that you believe that and that Christians believe that. Uh, and, and I believe that if you don't talk about the resurrection, you miss the power of the gospel. And modern preaching does tend to assume the resurrection, if it mentions it at all, and it tends to focus on the cross. Really since the Reformation, uh, you could argue that the Reformation was an argument about the meaning of the cross. And since then, we've still been arguing about it, we've still been talking about it, we've still been explaining it. And that's all good, and it's all well and good. And don't get me wrong, I love all of that. I wrote, I think it was 40 blog posts about the meaning of the cross, uh, when there was a big argument a few years ago about penal substitution. And yes, I'm very much in favour of that. However, there is a way of explaining penal substitution and the atonement and justification and how the cross is what saves us, that makes the resurrection an optional extra. A nice to have for Jesus. It's nice that he didn't stay dead. But it is not part of the core of the message if we're not careful. And it's not necessary, if you like, in the way in which we've explained it. And if we've done that, I say again, we've made a mistake. Because the preaching in the book of Acts, if you look at the gospel messages in the book of Acts, a good place to start, um, they actually assume the cross. Most of them don't even say about the cross. They just assume that everyone knew that Jesus had died. And they emphasise the resurrection. And uh, the resurrection is, is what's offered as, as, as the message of salvation, the message of hope. If you're going to talk about hope, the resurrection is critical to that. Because if Jesus rose again, he rose again so that you and I could rise again. And so that we would have a hope that goes beyond the grave. And remember at the moment, most people are not very conscious of struggling with guilt. I mean they do, but they bury it, they suppress it. And so often a better way in is to start with hope and then bring them to that point. And only in the resurrection can we find hope. So I've written another book which is not here today called 
Uh, Raised with Christ, How the Resurrection Changes Everything. You can get that on Amazon or uh, on my website as well. A bit cheaper, I think, on the website. And, and in that book, I unpack why the resurrection is so critical to, to our gospel presentation, to our understanding. It's not a book to give out to an unbeliever, uh, necessarily, but for someone who is a sort of uh, serious believer, if you like, or you know, recently educated, not, not you know, degree level educated, but certainly you know, someone who, who could cope with sort of A-level or GCSE, they'd be able to cope with that. Um, and uh, in that book, you know, I talk about that, and it was something that really hit home to me a few years ago. So the gospel story must include the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Absolutely critical. Um, and what does the gospel mean for us? So what we do now with this, we like to draw these diagrams. And uh, Toppy has been drawing these diagrams for a long time. And you, you know, you may have seen pits before, but often the pit is in between us and God. But here what we're saying is we're stuck in a pit. There's something quite nice about that. The, the humankind uh, is dead in sin. Uh, and we take them to Ephesians 2. And we'll say, look, without God, we're dead in our, in our sins. Uh, we're following the course of this world. We're all in the same boat. We're carrying out the desires of the body and mind, just doing what our body tells us, doing what our mind tells us. Um, but the Bible tells us that we're by nature children of wrath. And that therefore we're separated from God. You know, you can talk all about the separation from God there. Um, that it's our sin that separates us from God. And nothing that we can do ourselves will ever save us. And this is so important because so many times people hear Christian preaching and that what they think we're saying is, stop sinning, do this, do that, do the next thing, and then God will be pleased with you. Now, of course, that's not what we're saying, but it's very easy for people to hear that. Uh, I have a, a very good friend uh, who grew up with a very good Christian preacher. You would know this person's name if I mentioned their father's name. And their father was a great preacher of the gospel. But nonetheless, despite the fact that their father was a great preacher of the gospel, this child grew up thinking it was all about pleasing God by law and by his own efforts. And I think, well, if his kid could learn that, it wasn't that that was what he was being taught, but that's what he heard, because, of course, the God of this world blinds the minds of the unbelievers. So it's very important that we make it clear that all our efforts to please God are hopeless. I think that's a really critical thing to say, you know, to someone who's inquiring at this point, that... You know, we're not just calling them to a better life, to, you know, to strive harder. And then stage two, that actually we are made alive. That, uh, that when we become a Christian, you know, Jesus came into our pit. And because of that, uh, because of his death and his resurrection, uh, he has provided us the way out of the pit. And you know, he loved us even when we were dead. And so it's not wrong to point to someone and say, God loves you. He died for you. And he made us alive together with Christ. And so, all who, as, as John 1, 2 says, all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So now we can get out of the pit. We can be back in our relationship with God. We can be raised with him. We can be seated with him in order that he can show his grace to the whole universe. We're made alive. We're lifted out of the pit. And we're in a relationship with God. But you see, that is still, in a sense, the story. This is now this, what I've described now as the story for the individual. And that's all well and good, but what we still haven't done is bring that person to a point of decision. And I think sometimes with our gospel preaching, we can forget to do that. You know, we, we think our job is done when we proclaimed, and then maybe we've had a few conversations. But what we've not done is explain to them what they need to do if they actually want to become a Christian. And, and if you don't do that, don't be surprised if they don't become a Christian. You know, they might be convinced. But it's pretty hopeless if you've not shown them how to do it. So we uh, describe uh, the response that the gospel calls for. Uh, and really that's one of the reasons why we wanted to write a book. We wanted a book that would help people make that response. And uh, where do you go? And, and the best place really in some ways to go is the very first sermon in Pentecost. You know, Peter was asked the question, what must we do to be saved? And how many of our folk don't know how to answer that question? How many pastors would struggle to answer that question, I wonder, sometimes? And uh, his answer is very simple. He says, repent, uh, be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then later on it explains that they were added to the church that day, uh, about 3,000 souls who believed. So again, you know, I wonder if anyone in that 120 were like, oh, I wanted it to be more informal. We've got 3,000 now. <laughs> Hope for the old days, it was just us and Jesus. 
There's always a church down the road you can go to if you're in that position, that's fine. Um, sorry. <laughs> I've lost my train of thought completely now. But, you know, basically what we would say here is that there are four things that he emphasises that, if you like, mark the beginning of the Christian life. Now, obviously, repent is the first one, and that's the one you tend to emphasise. But I think it's important not to ignore all the others here. There's, a, there's baptism, there's receiving the gift of the Spirit. And, you know, we need to be careful on that because we get into all sorts of arguments about that one. But it's there in the text, you know? Um, and then it's being added to the people of God. So those, those are the four things. So how do we explain those four things? Well, repentance is the first one, it's the most important one, it's the one that naturally leads to the others, and therefore is the most critical. Uh, we would argue there's four components to this. It's a change of mind, it's a change of heart, it's a change of behaviour, and a change of direction. And there's no way that most people are going to know what the heck repentance means today. They're not going to know. So you have to explain, you have to summarise it, you have to tell them what it means. Uh, and explain to them it's not just stopping your sin. Because that's the thing, if you say someone repent, well, they, if they understand anything, they might think what you're saying is stop sinning. Which is of course part of it, but actually that's more of a product of it than the thing itself, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, and change for the Christian starts on the inside out, not from the outside in. And if you try and make someone, you know, follow God's laws before they've been born again, that's a recipe for disaster. Now, of course, repentance is often used in acts interchangeably with belief, and it's a very important thing that is part of that, because what we think affects how we believe. Um, one of the things I sometimes say, it'd be a bit crazy, you know, I wouldn't say this to a room full of non-Christians, but for Christians, you know, it'd be a bit crazy if you said you were a Baptist, but you never baptised people. <laughs> it makes no sense. So what we think affects what we believe, uh, and how we behave. I mean, So we mustn't just change externals, you must be born again. Uh, and what do you need to believe? What does repentance look like? Well, you know, at its core, it really, is a change of our belief. Uh, and I think Romans 10 is a great place to take someone to. Um, again, let's take them to the Scriptures. Let's not assume they know the Scriptures. Let's not summarise the Scriptures for them. Let's show them the actual words of the Scripture. Now, very often I've sat with people on a Sunday morning and responded to the Gospel and said, let me just show you this passage so we can talk about what you've just done. And, you know, maybe it needs a bit more explanation. And Romans 10, 9 tells us what it is that we need to believe. It says this, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, the thing about this is you have to explain it, because on itself, they're not going to get that. But it's critical, it's very important, and it is actually quite easy to explain. So, confess with your mouth. So what we're saying is you need to tell someone that you want to become a Christian, or that you are now a Christian. It's very important. You can't keep it to yourself. Uh, you need to tell God, others, and other people, that we will now follow Jesus. Often the best person to tell is a Christian at first, obviously. Uh, but it shouldn't really stop there. And telling other people solidifies our relationship with God. And sometimes I talk about getting married here in this context, that it's a little bit like some people say, well, a piece of paper doesn't mean anything. But, but actually, that act of standing before people and saying that you're now committing yourself to your husband or wife is a very powerful moment. And for a person becoming a Christian to actually declare that publicly, <coughs> sometimes we just say, oh, well, you can do it in your own heart. And that's true to an extent. But I think if we leave them there, it's almost like they're only half-born. And Paul would hereby suggest that they're not even born again, you know, if they've not confessed with their mouth. I mean, it says it clearly, if, if you confess with your mouth. Uh, so you have to tell people, uh, and say, so you should do first question. What is it you have to say? Well, that, that Jesus is Lord. And again, we have to explain what we mean. So what, what do we mean by that? Well, we're saying that we are choosing to worship him as God. And so I will take them through that the word Lord is used in the Bible, usually for God, you know? Um, so what we're saying is Jesus is divine, he's the Son of God. Uh, but also that we're going to follow him as our Lord. Uh, and at this point it's usually a good idea to explain that obviously you're not saying that it's suddenly going to become perfect overnight, but that with the best will in the world you're going to try and follow him and you're going to try and obey him. But he will help you as you do that. And that you're going to worship him. You need to admit that you've sinned against him and ask him to forgive you. And I think it is good to challenge people that you can't simply... Pretend you're a Christian and carry on living for yourself. If you, Jesus is your Lord, then you must obey him and give him your total allegiance. And I think that's really important. Because too many people want to just add Jesus to their life. And they're not willing to stop and make that commitment. People won't make a commitment to anything in this day and age. They dip their toes in and out of anything. 
Um, and our solution as Christians is not to back away from that, but to emphasise it even more. Because if, if you have people, I remember talking to one person years ago who was like a Hindu, and she said, oh yeah, I follow Jesus. But actually what she meant was she followed her, him as well, as all her other gods. Uh, and, and you don't want that in, in people that you're sharing the gospel with. And I love the way Toppy puts this, and that again is in the book. He says, look, when Jesus says, follow me, it's not like on Twitter where you just click a button. He wants your whole life. <laughs> he wants everything. It's not shy away from challenging people with that level of commitment. Believe what? In your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. So again, the resurrection, absolutely critical here. Uh, thanking Jesus for dying for you and for rising from the dead to you. Very important in your, in your prayer of commitment that you include that thing, that you know, the people are declaring their belief that Jesus died for them, that he rose again for them. And if they can't say that, then they're not ready to become a Christian. Uh, one of the definitions, well, this is a definition I wrote when I was writing Grace of Christ, actually, that a Christian is someone who believes in the physical resurrection of Jesus from the dead and lives their life in light of the implications of that event. Now, the interesting thing about that is it's a very broad definition, and I think pretty much every denominational group would agree with it, but where we disagree with is perhaps on the, last, the second bit, you know? And that's fine, so I like that. I like the fact that it's broad enough for us all to sign up to, but also narrow enough for us to realise that there's a possibility that someone who says they believe may not really be a Christian because they're not living the life. You know, they haven't been born again. They haven't made that real, genuine commitment. And, you know, there is no more important question than did Jesus rise from the dead? And it really is the foundation on which our faith stands. So if we believe that, then we're a Christian. If we don't believe that, we're not. It's really that simple. And, and it's a great way to set someone up to do a bit of apologetics research at this point if they need to. If they're not sure yet, well, you know, then be sure. And ensure your people know the evidence of Jesus' resurrection. And you know what? I'm such a kind guy. I'm giving them very things free today. <laughs> and there's a free article on there. But there's lots, lots of books about this. You know, there's loads of stuff on this. You, the Case for Christ was one of them. But if you want just a simple, short article that is a chapter from Race with Christ, it's available there. You can have a look at that. But make sure that the people you're in your church know why we believe Jesus rose again. It gives them that confidence. It's not going to... I don't think apologetics usually makes someone a Christian, but it gives you better confidence as a Christian. You know? And it can also answer the questions that people have before they become a Christian and remove barriers. So it's almost like, sorry, I'm going to use a technical term now. Uh, anyone here know what a bimodal distribution is? I'm going to draw this. I hope this isn't going to break my... Right, so... A bimodal distribution looks like something like this. Okay? Alright? So it's got two peaks. And I think when it comes to apologetics, often it's got two peaks. So you might call this pre-evangelism, if you like. This is the person who says, you know, I'm an atheist, I don't believe all that rubbish. And you hit them with all that apologetic stuff. It's great, you know, that's some discussion. But actually there comes a point where all that fades away. And what we're looking at here is the decision point. And that's what this book's about. We don't talk about apologetics in here at all, but deliberately. Because actually, at this point, you're not trying to raise questions. Because there comes a point in your Christian journey where you go, actually, you know what, I haven't got all the answers. And really, that's not the point. I'm not going to be argued into my faith. I have to make a decision. Knowing what I know, am I willing to follow Jesus? Am I willing to say, God, if you're real, come into my life, come and... Make me a follower of you. So at this point, apologetics is not very helpful, and nor is it that helpful immediately afterwards. But after a little while, then I think it's very helpful. And so that's why you then talk about apologetics. So there's lots of great apologetics books out there, um, and uh, so I think it's helpful. And I haven't talked about that much today deliberately, because I'm focusing more on that point, if you like, you know, of, of decision. So here's the thing. Almost anywhere you go in the world today, you will meet people who call themselves Christians. They will worship in different ways, and they will believe different things. But they will all agree that Jesus rose again, that he is alive, and that he is Lord, as we sang at the beginning of the day. And the good news is this. He will build his church, and he's not finished with the UK yet.
Amen. 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 And that's me done. Amen. Amen. Right, any questions? You look like you've got a question about it, no? Or are you just too, no. <laughs> too many questions? Yeah. <laughs> questions, comments, thoughts? My heretic? <laughs> <laughs> The bit I always find the, the trickiest bit in Christian life is we uh, love reaching out to the lost. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we kind of in the work from here, um, there's always been uh, uh, a strong sort of emphasis in that. And then just that kind of awkward divide, which I think we've kind of experienced here between uh, all the stuff that goes on for the six days of the week and the seventh day or first day of the week, just in, the, in there, and just that bridging of that gap. Have you got any words of wisdom you want to throw into that? Oh gosh, yeah. There's a whole other day really on that. But I think the point is this. You have to put yourself in the shoes of someone who's never been to church. Mm -hmm. And ask yourself, what's it like walking through that door? Mm -hmm. You know, what's going to put them off? You know, what's going to encourage them? What is going to just mystify them? What can you do to make it easier, make it clearer? You know, um... So I don't know. I mean, one example might be hymn books. I don't know. How many people still use hymn books? How many people would be uncomfortable flicking through a page would rather have it on the screen? That's an example. I'm not saying, therefore thou must never use hymn books. But it just means that perhaps if you are going to use hymn books, you need to be a little bit more, uh, give them a little bit longer to figure it out than you perhaps used to in the past, where everyone knew how to use hymn books. But you, know, you have to think those things through. Little stupid thing. Okay, this will make you laugh. We at Jubilee started as a small church, so we were very keen, as many small churches are, on one loaf and one cup for the communion. So you pass around a loaf of bread and a cup of wine. Now, that's all well and good when you're tiny, but as you start to grow, what do you do? Okay, so maybe we'll have a bigger loaf. <laughs> maybe we'll have two loaves. Uh, maybe we'll have three cups, but it's kind of one cup. I mean, already you've got three cups, you know. But then what we found was this, this is really interesting, that... Nigerians, we find, are very concerned about hygiene, much more so than the Brits. Uh, so when you think about it, passing a cup around, it's pretty disgusting. <laughs> um, even if you've got a cloth to wipe it, it's like, you know, by the time it's gone down a row of 50 people, how many people's germs are you taking into you, you know? So what we discovered was that, the, towards the back of our church, they always, for some reason, sit at the back, maybe because they're embarrassed, I don't know, would be rows of black people where all the white people were sitting there at the front, and when the communion came around, they just passed it by. What the heck? So, you know, we had to talk about it, think about it, work it through, and in the end, we had to go for the little cups, which for some people, we've never done it that way before. But then the Nigerians started drinking the little cups, and that was fine. Do you see what I mean? So that's a stupid example, but life is made of those sort of stupid decisions, and you can make a decision that says, right, we're going to do it this way, because we've always done it this way, and it's more comfortable for us, that then puts other people off. Or you can say, right, we're going to do it this way, because we know that's going to be better for the visitor. Now, of course, we don't compromise our faith, we don't, you know... So what we sometimes talk about in Jubilee is we say, we don't really want to go the whole way of being like seeker-sensitive, seeker like some people talk about. You know, there's this whole seeker-sensitive movement yeah. that where it becomes all about the seeker, the service, and there's, there's no sort of content for the believer there, and it becomes purely outreach. Well, we're not, we're not going there, but what we want to do is be seeker-aware. Mm. That just gives you a hint, sorry, I could spend hours on that. But. And it follows on from that question, how you, you've talked about you know, using the, the modern social internet, blah, blah, yeah. blah, in terms of communicating kind of outside the church. Yeah. In your church services, are there things that you might do differently to a traditional church, more traditional church like we might attend, to do what you've just said, to make them feel welcome, but without compromising on that Christian content for the believer? Yeah. How, how do you square that circle kind of thing? Well, there's the simple things like making sure that you've got literature around, making sure that we have a, at the beginning of the service, we have slides going around the screen with some of the announcements, you know, and that might include the website address. 
um, so that someone who's new can see stuff on the screen and they're not talking to someone. Um, I think that, you know, we use more modern music. I think that's partly a stylistic decision. There's probably some theology behind that as well. Um, in terms of, you know, uh, a lot of the hymns we sing today were actually, the tunes were taken from the, the gin houses anyway. People don't realize that. William Booth used to take the gin house tunes and put Christian words to them. And now some Christians will sing those and say, well, we don't want to sing the devil's music. Well, actually, they are just the devil's ex music. So, <laughs> now, now, that doesn't, I mean, we sing hymns as well. You know, and I'm not saying rip up the hymns, because actually, you know, in some areas, uh, it might be better to carry on with the hymns, because at least people know them, you know, still some of the older people. So, again, it's, it's, it's contextualization. But for us, um, you know, we have drums, we have guitars, we have music. We try and make it good, high quality, without it being too professional. We don't want it to be so slick that it, it's like a concert, and then people just sit there watching. But, you know, we are very aware that... You know, with the generation that watches MTV and all the rest of it, if you've got really poor quality musicians out there, it's going to put them off. So, I mean, that's, I don't know if that's sort of answering some of your questions. A couple of observations. Yeah. Um, recently at church, uh, we had communion, as yeah. we would all do so, and we just had bread and wine, as we yeah. mostly do. But we realised that one or two of the guys in church were alcoholic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we haven't made any provision right. for them. <laughs> and that actually, what that caused was a guy who was too embarrassed to say no yeah. went up and had a sip of wine and he was gone within two weeks. Right. Back to his alcoholism. Oh, yeah, nice. well, uh, again, a few years, about the same time we, we switched to, to the four cups. By the way, we still have a loaf that we cut up, but anyway. Um, we also yeah. ditch, ditch yeah. alcohol for everyone, actually. Yeah. So we use non-alcohol wine but for everyone. But it's quite a debate. It, it so is. many people, should we have wine or should we have squash? Does yeah. it matter? Well, we don't have squash. So I think we have sort of non-alcoholic yeah. wine is what, what we do. But, yeah. uh, and that was partly actually for the Africans as well, to be honest. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, because they have a much more... Well, the Americans do as well. A lot of American Christians won't drink any alcohol. And a lot of African Christians won't drink any alcohol either. Um, so again, that was another reason why they weren't taking it. So. Mm -hmm. I go to one church, when it's communion, you can have it at one cup, at a small cup, you can have it alcoholic or not. <laughs> 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 and and you have to drink it Yeah, I was going to say, it sounds like a... It sounds like a... It sounds like, a, it sounds like, a, it sounds like an agriculture. <laughs> oh, oh. It sounds like a drive-thru. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's on the weekend bread. <laughs> when it comes to um, dealing with people and understanding and reacting to their culture, yeah. where they're coming from and so on, how do you react to the uh, debate, the, the viewpoints on how you approach Islam and the Muslims? In the, I mean, the people like Jay Smith and so on, who with at Hyde Park Common be very aggressive. Right. Because he said, at the end of the day, they do not respect people who will not argue. Right. And so he would be very aggressive about it, because that's what that shows that he really believes in. Right. Right. And uh, he, it, 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 some people don't like it. Yeah. You know, because it creates an argument. But I think, to be honest, it depends on the person you're talking to. Mm. I think that's the thing. We have a terrible habit of lumping everyone into one group yeah. and saying that's the way we've got to respond to them. And actually, you know, it depends both on you as an individual and on the person that you're talking to. Because not everyone is gifted or enabled to, to talk in that sort of way with people and they're not to come across aggressive and nasty, you know. Um, so I think you have to just you have to just adjust yourself to the person that you're with. Uh, Someone was telling me over lunch that you know they'd done some work with Muslims and that they at the time they met these Muslims they were very conscious of their own sort of ignorance of, of their faith. But, so what did they do? Well, they actually went and asked them questions. The Muslims they were talking to, well, what do you believe? And you know a bit like what we're talking about with the God test. And actually, in a way, that kind of very ignorance is almost more engaging than it would be if you came out and said, well, I know what you believe. Do you? Because they all have different views anyway. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I've never advocated being weak on the gospel or compromising it. But I do think sometimes, it depends on the person you're talking to, but some people to engage them more to a helpful way. So.
Hmm. I'm going to duck that question and say both and. <laughs> You, you've obviously communicated in various ways that, that um, you want your whole believing congregation to be aware of the gospel, yeah. to be able to communicate the gospel, yeah. to take this out as it were. Mm -hmm. So can you just perhaps share one or two ways that you make that happen within the church? Okay, sure. Well, when we brought out the book, we gave everyone a free copy on a Sunday. Uh, we then made it available very cheaply for people to buy for their friends. We wanted them to actually feel that they were contributing to that, so that rather than just give them an unlimited supply. Uh, but, um, so that's one thing. I, I think just the preaching, week in, week out, and in fact we had a whole series just recently which we entitled Jesus the Great Evangelist, and we took them through four different encounters that Jesus had and explained how he was being a good evangelist and how they could do that. Um, we had Rice Brooks come and do a, uh, a day conference um, from some of his material. Uh, our 300 leaders event. Um, that's not online yet, but it will be. Um, you know, we've, we've done things in our small group training, our small group leaders training. You know, we do things in our membership course. So our membership course, again, will go through the gospel with people, make sure they're saved before they join them on the dotted line. Um, you know, then we have other courses that we do for people as so they go down through the journey from the track towards perhaps becoming a leader down the line. Uh, so we have various discipleship courses that again we'll go through in more detail. So it's just there in everything we do. And, and on a Sunday morning, if you come into Jubilee, at the very top of the screen, uh, it will always say the same message, it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. That's our sort of slogan. Some people try and come up with flashy ones, but we just put that up there. Um, and, and you know, people ask us as well, so yeah, and it's just trying to make sure as a culture in, in the whole church for all of that. Seems to go right back to what you said at the beginning, confidence that Jesus is Lord. Yeah. And then that permeates your, your life together. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. And the thing is, to be honest as well, when you've got a bit of a track history together, and you've seen it, you know, and there's been another baptism service and more people getting saved, you, you end up with a sort of spiritual momentum, mm. which I think is, is, you can't manufacture that. Mm. Uh, and it's one of the challenges, I think, for a lot of churches, trying to sort of desperately bring that life uh, when it's not there. You know, I, I think, you know, it's, it's difficult, you know, and, uh, but, but as I say, you build on what you've got. It's important to, to take advantage of what has happened, you know, and to remember and keep thanking God and reminding people and, you know, celebrating the successes that you have had. How do you do your baptisms in the cinema? Yeah. <laughs> well, believe it or not, we have a, a tank. It's a fairly small tank. It's a um, bespoke thing that allows you to have one person in the tank with the person being baptised and the second person to assist is actually outside. So it is less water. So we build a little uh, area with a tarpaulin so any spillage will be caught in that. Um, and, you know, it's near the door so we pump all the water out afterwards. I would not have liked to, I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall on the conversation with the cinema at the time, but, <laughs> <laughs> but we didn't do it straight away either. So for the first year or two, maybe even longer, of being in the cinema, we used to borrow other churches' baptistries, which was very good of them. I know some churches would borrow swimming pools as well. You can hire out a swimming pools sometimes and do it there. Um, because, you know, it's all about building relationship and trust. So you go to them eventually and say, well, you know, we've not destroyed your building yet. We've got this wacky idea. They're more likely to listen if you've got a track record. Mm -hmm. so we, I don't think we'd have been able to do that on the first week. <laughs> Just um, wondered if you've got any comments on integrating unchurched men who get saved yeah. into the church. Because today, they don't have any understanding of what even church looks like. Yeah. And then coming week in, week out, like we've done because we were brought up to it, yeah. but there is a disconnect now. No, sure. And I'm, it's a real struggle, especially for guys who perhaps, as I say, have no connection to church. Yeah. Never seen it, never been inside one. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think relationship really helps. But that can be a challenge to build as well. Uh, I'm thinking of one guy who was completely not Christian. His wife was in the church. Uh, I mean, he'd kind of been brought up almost as an atheist. Um, but, you know, there was a few guys in the church who were, were praying for him. And any opportunity would say hello to him. I think he, he may have started by coming to the odd social, you know, with his wife at Christmas or something. 
and they were just friendly. And, and then he got sick, interestingly. And for one or two of these people that he vaguely knew in the church were so sort of supportive of him. And I think what, what was the key thing actually was someone just saying simply, oh, I'm praying for you. Mm. And that got under his skin. And, and then he was starting to ask all sorts of questions because he'd been sick and he was now getting better. Um, and he thought, oh, do you know what? I'll finally go to this Alpha course that my wife has been nagging me about for years. And so he said, if I go to the Alpha course, will you leave me alone? <laughs> <laughs> and Alpha's really good because it is a limited, yeah. it's a time limited yeah. thing. It's mm -hmm. not come to church for the rest of your life. It's come for these few weeks. And so I think we do courses quite a lot. And that, I think that helps as well, even when someone's a Christian. So come to our discipleship course, it's four weeks or whatever. Yeah. You know? Come to our membership course, it's two yeah. weeks, you know. Um, but anyway, so he came on to that, and by the end of it, you know, um, he was saved. And uh, we, we started a group after, out of that Alpha course with the people he knew. And I think for him, a lot of it is the relationships that, that's kept him going. And years later, um, you know, he's still doing really well. So, But yeah, you're right. Um, one of the challenges, actually, is we say, come to a small group. It meets in someone's house. And they go, well, I don't go in strangers' houses. <laughs> no, yeah. Seriously. And I have the issue that some of the guys I deal with, some of my church don't want them in their house. Well, yes. <laughs> <clears throat> that would be the same in most You know, what, you know what's a great place? Costa. Costa Coffee. Yeah, well, they that's, shut what, at that's seven. what I do with them. The but no, but what I'm saying is, we actually, you, you we, what we've done is we've hired yeah. a Costa Coffee, okay. and actually we've run out. We've not done so great, but we have wondered about it. But we we, we do our, our alpha course in a Costa Coffee because yeah. they normally shut at seven anyway. Yeah. So you just you can easily persuade them to stay open and be exclusive to you and run an alpha course in them. The local Tesco's allow that as well. Okay. Because their cafe shut at night. Yeah. It's really great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Ed, I would like to share a bit on uh, what you're doing in Erfurt at the moment. Oh, the multi site thing? Yeah. Okay. Well, this is interesting as well, because, I mean, as a church begins to grow, you know, you have this problem where you can't fit everyone in anymore. Uh, and you also have another problem which happens, is people start travelling to you, which is okay, it's great, it's nice on a Sunday. But actually, in terms of then they're then doing local ministry, it doesn't always work so well. So, and a lot of churches have found this that if you then do a church plant down the road, sometimes it doesn't work because your people don't want to go. So, um, so that's the challenge. So, uh, one of the things that start it really happened a bit in the U.S., but actually it's been happening over here for a while. I mean, Holy Trinity Brompton have done this for years. Kensington Temple have done this for years. It's this whole multi-site model. So, with the multi-site model, it, I, I said to some of the guys, it kind of feels like cheating. <laughs> because you're, you're church planting, but without setting out something completely separate. You know, we've got this idea that every congregation must be completely independent. Well, I don't think that's necessarily true. Uh, and there are lots of people that can do a bit of pastoral work, but don't really have the anointing or the call or the gifting to hold the congregation together and to be the, the main guy. So what we do, uh, and we're doing it now in two other places other than on a, our own main site. I mean, even on our main site, we're in multiple screens on a Sunday, because we can't all fit in one screen. Um, is that you have, a, you have a team, a leadership team of the site, and some of those members of that leadership team will preach from time to time, but they're not the sort of people that can, between them, preach every week, or not without the quality going down. Because I know for me, for example, I, you know, I enjoy speaking, but when I was, at one point, I was preaching every other week, and I still had a secular job. And, and I think, to be honest, even if I didn't have a secular job, I would struggle to preach even every other week ongoingly. You know, I'm much more someone that I'd much rather have longer to prepare and come with something that's on my heart than have to do it relentlessly every, every week. And so what we do uh, is we have them as part of the umbrella of the church. And sometimes actually those sites have in the past and other settings then eventually spun out as individual churches, but sometimes they just carry on. I mean, and so what we do there is we've got a guy who someone here knows actually, I think he's, yes. <laughs> so he, he's a good example of this. You know, I think if you said to him, plant a church now, he'd be like, no way. But what he's doing is every week, he leads that place, he, he introduces it, he, you know, he either leads the worship or someone else leads the worship, and he's the one afterwards that everyone's going to, and you know, during the week he works for us, does a lot of the pastoral stuff. And yes, maybe once a month or every six or eight weeks he will preach, but the rest of the time it tends to be Toppy that will preach. And sometimes that's on video, and sometimes that's live. So Toppy can't be in two places at once, but with video he can. So that's the way we do that. It's a little unusual, I know it's a little bit different, 
But the results have been quite striking because what happened there was that there was a small church there already but it was really struggling, had no leadership. They'd not been able to find a leader for a very long time. They were about 30 people. And uh, by God's grace, just in a matter of months, it's just mushroomed. And some of that's people that have come from the main church who were travelling to us from Ilford, now going to Ilford to, to be part of that. Um, some of that is the advertising that we've been able to put in. But some of it is just people feeling more positive so that they're inviting their friends. Because I think if you feel that you're getting a positive experience in church, you're much more likely to bring your friend along. You know? And also, of course, visitors who come and say, oh, I like this, I'm going to come back. I mean, I remember in our early days, we had a whole year where we had visitors every week, but not one of them stayed. Because <laughs> 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 we were meeting in a horrible hall, and I don't know, but anyway, yeah, that was a horrible year, that one. So we, we you know, believe it, believe me, we know what it's like to struggle as well as to be very blessed. So, if someone... Okay. I'll have a uh, question of prayer time after this. Okay. <laughs> Hang on, okay. Um, yeah, you hear the view uh, expressed uh, these days that the come to church doesn't work anymore, and the future lies in fresh expressions. Yet, uh, what you said about Jubilee would seem to run yeah. counter to that. Yeah. Observations on that position? Well, I think Jesus says, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. So there is a go and tell, mm -hmm. and, and there is an you know, incarnational ministry, but actually, you know, what did he say, what, what did uh, the Samaritan want to come and see? So I think go and tell and come and see don't have to be contradictory, you know. So I think, you know, Jesus said he'd build the church. I don't think he's got a plan B. I really don't. But that doesn't mean that some of these other things are not relevant as bridges, you know, to church. Um, but to be honest, this might shock you, but our alphas, although we've had some measure of success in them, they're not the prime driver of our evangelism. The majority of people that get saved in Jubilee get saved on a Sunday morning. You know, maybe that's not how it should be, maybe that is how it should be, but we're pretty happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to suggest that we, um, thanks very much again.